Okay, many of you have joined. Abhishek, Ashwin, Chinmay, Devika, Shri, Dhananjay, Huda, Ida, Lakshmana Murthy, Karthik, Kiran, Koperun, Rohit, Sandeep, Satyavrat, Velins. Okay. So let's get take the number close to 30 and then we'll start. Ilamati have joined. So uh, today's lecture will be on mathematical physics. Uh, this has a huge weightage in uh, the CSR net and gate. Pragadishwari and uh, somebody else have joined. Josephine have joined. How many of you are M uh, MSc first year other than the NIT people? How many of you are from MSc first year? Any MSc first year people? No. Okay, shall we start? Nekha has joined. Shall we start the session, guys? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead. Okay, let me switch off my video. This will consume more of your data. So am I audible and is my screen visible? Yes, sir. OK. So uh, today's uh, lecture will be on mathematical physics. So in line, uh, just one second. OK, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Oh, you can see my screen, right? Whatever I'm writing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, OK, fine. So uh, as I told you before, before you go to any topic, you should have a look at the syllabus. OK, and uh, you should study only those things which are mentioned in the syllabus. And also you should refer to the previous year questions to know which parts of the syllabus are carrying more weightage and which parts are not being asked frequently okay so uh, today in today's lecture we'll take up some of the easy parts of mathematical physics which are highly scoring and also which are very frequently asked in these examinations okay the reason is see five marks is five marks you get a five marks by solving an easy question or solve uh, getting a five marks by solving a very difficult question, it doesn't make much of a difference. OK, so you should be uh, making yourself sure that all the scoring questions, all the relatively easy questions are tackled by you properly. OK, so in today's class, we'll be touching some topics like uh, linear algebra matrices, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, then uh, complex analysis, analytical functions, poles, residues, evaluation of integration, uh, integrals and so on. OK. Uh, in today's lecture, my approach will be reverse. So in the last two lectures, what I was doing is I was trying to explain some concept 
and then I was taking you to problem solving. But uh, today is just one lecture of mathematical physics, so I'm reversing this. I'll be directly tackling problems and parallelly I'll be explaining uh, and then I'll be explaining the concepts necessary to solve the problems if you are not familiar with. OK, so this approach I call the approach of life. Why? Because a teacher first teaches you and then take you to problems, but life first takes you to problem and then teaches you. OK, that's why I call this as the approach of life learning through problem solving. So are you ready for the first problem? Yes, no. Give me an energetic yes. Yes, sir. This was not energetic. Yes. Sir. yes. OK. So let us uh, try to get into the first problem of the day, which is which belongs to the topic of complex analysis. See the topics that I'm going to touch today. Believe me, these are highly asked not only in net and gate, but in many other competitive exams. OK, you will find them every, everywhere and they carry a lot of weightage. OK. So uh, it's better to know some tricks and tips of these topics. OK, let us go to the first question. Let u x y a function is given by this particular expression be the real part of analytical function fz of the complex variable given by this. So this is the real part. That means fz is a function which will have u plus iv. u part is given to be this. And what is asked is what will be the v part. OK, so how do you solve this problem is? We have something called Cauchy Riemann equation, which will tell you the necessary condition for a function to be analytic. OK, there are more conditions to this, but if you check the necessary conditions, that will be at least from the competition point of view, you will see that uh, your job is done from the this Cauchy Riemann equation only by the necessary condition only. OK, these are the two equations you need to check. To find out whether a function is analytic or not. Or if it is said that the function is analytic and you are given one part of it, the real part, how to find the imaginary part. OK, now before that, let me ask you a question. What do you mean by analytic function? Anybody? What is your understanding of an analytic function? It is differentiable. Very the good. The limit exists is... between the given region. Sir. Specified region. What limit exists? Uh... Uh, for the specified region, if the limit exists, yeah. means we can continuously differentiate at the, all the points. OK, in the if the limit exists, yeah, yeah, that also leading you to the same thing. If the limit is existing uh, for all the like uh, for the entire region, and finally it's leading you to differentiability only. OK, now tell me why is why do you call a function which is like n times differentiable to be analytic? Can you think more on this? What is the literal meaning of the word analytic or analysis? So in other words, it's a function which you can do analysis, right? How do you analyze? In mathematics, we analyze by taking various derivatives, right? Like the, you have calculated the slope, then whether it's a maxima, a minima, or a general point. And even if it is maxima, minima, you talk about the curvature, whether it is concave, convex, all these are what? These are analysis, isn't it? We are analyzing the function, OK? But those things are possible. Why? Because we are able to find the slope, which is given by ddx. We are able to find the curvature, which is given by d2, dx square, and so on. We can keep on going. OK, so hence, if the functions, all the derivatives are existing, you can say that the function is analytic function okay so in other other ways of telling this is that you can express the function uh, as a power series expansion power series expansion or you can say taylor expansion why taylor expansion because i hope you know what is taylor expansion you can write fx equal to taylor expansion about certain point fx not plus all these things right? x minus x not into f prime x f prime at x not plus x minus x naught whole square by two factorial f double prime. So if the Taylor series is, uh, if you can Taylor expand, that means what? All these derivatives exist, only then you can Taylor expand the things, okay? So all these are related things. So when you get the word analytic, all these things should come into your mind. You don't know which of them will come, which we are, will be of use in your question, okay? 
Okay, now coming to this uh, two equations. The partial derivative of the real part with respect to x is equal to the partial derivative of the imaginary part with respect to y. And when you cross it, it is an, a negative sign comes up. Okay. Uh, one short way to understand uh, or to remember this negative sign because some people may miss this is just consider uh, z is equal to x plus i y. Okay. Now you tell me if your function f of z is simply z, is it analytic? It's analytic, right? See, when you say when you say analytic means it is differentiable. So d dz of that function should be existing, right, all the time. So if it is z, f of z is z itself, then also all the derivatives exist, right? The first derivative will be one and all the other derivatives will be zero. Zero is not a problem, but it is existing, right? So is f of z is equal to z analytic? Yes. So that means f of z is x plus i y. So if you take a x derivative of the real part that is going to be equal to 1. And if you take the y derivative of the imaginary part that is also equal to 1. So this is related to this equation. The next thing you, this is just a way to remember. This is not a very formal thing. This is just a hack or which we call jugar in Hindi. Okay. F of z is equal to iz. This is also going to be analytic, right? I mean, these are two examples by which you can uh, convince yourself about these two equations. Okay, this is not a formal proof. F of z is equal to iz is also going to be analytic because all the derivatives of this also exist. The first derivative is going to be i and all other derivatives are going to be equal to zero. Now, if f of z is equal to iz, then that means f of z is equal to iz means what? ix plus i into iy. That is, it is equal to minus y plus ix, isn't it? So if you take the first derivative of the real part with respect to y, first derivative of the real part with respect to y, this is going to be minus 1. And if you're going to take the uh, first derivative of the imaginary part with respect to x, it is going to be plus 1. To make a balance, you need a minus. That's why you dump a minus here. Okay, by taking this two examples, see, if in exam pressure, if you forget where this minus sign was, please remember this, these two examples, f of z is equal to z and f of z is equal to iz. Okay. While I was explaining these things, can uh, did any of you actually solve this and get an answer to this? Yes, sir. Yes, option? option. Yes. Yes. Option? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. A, okay. So how did you do this? Can you please elaborate? A. Yes, yes, A, I know how. Sir, I use the first relation, sir. Okay, you use I, the first I, relation. I differentiated the u of x and integrated the answer with, with respect to y. Integrate. Very good. Sir, I differentiate the answer. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, no, no, first you did a differentiation. Del u with by. With respect to x. Del u by del x, okay? Then you got and something. I integrated what the answer. Got? Yes, then you integrated the answer. That's the thing I'm saying. Okay, anybody else did anything better? Back calculation. From Back calculation. Yes, and yes. Okay, good, Mosam. So, uh, what he has done is also fine. See, if you do a, by the way, the answer is A, yes. If you do del u by del x, so del del x of this is 1, then this will be twice x, 2, 2 will be cancelled, this will be 1 plus x, isn't it? Now, instead of doing integration and all, you can directly, by looking at the option, you can say, you know, why to do an integration? You can say that what will be del del, del del y of the imaginary part should give you the same thing, right, from the first equation. So, del del y of this is what? 1 plus x. Yes, this is a possibility. This del del y is x. Del, del del y is 1. And this will be something else, okay? So, once you get just 1 plus x. You don't need to do anything. Just look at the answers. And the examiner will give, there is a good chance that the examiner will give only one option which is matching. Because the examiner wants to save you, save your time. Believe me, the examiner wants to save your time. But you should be knowing the tricks and tips to save that. Okay. This is a formal way of doing. There is nothing wrong in that. And this is an easy thing. You can integrate. But what if the expression was 1 plus x square plus log of x or something. 
then integrating this is going to be difficult. Integrating log of x is little tricky. Okay, so hence it is be better to check all these answers. Whether you have to do this process only when you find a clash, that means two of the options are giving you the same thing. Then you have to do the formal way. But since there is only one option which del del uh, y is giving one plus x, so other options are already ruled out. Do I need to explain this once again? Please let me know. Or are we done with this? Did I make a mess of this slide? Anybody wants repetition? I can, I just will just take me one minute. You just need to tell a yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, I'll just let me take a blank slide. See, u is given, okay? Excuse u is me? given to be some, yes. Sorry, your presentation is not present. Oh, sorry. I have to share it again because actually uh, only my presentation is more is shared. Now is it visible? Yes, sir. Okay. See, u is given, okay? And I know an equation del u by, uh, del, u by del x is equal to del v by some people also call this do. I prefer calling it del. Okay. Del u by del x equal to del v by del y. This is a Cauchy Riemann equation. Okay. I am given u and I need to find v. Okay. Now what I will do is I will do del u by del x. I got 1 plus x. Okay. I got from the question. Okay. 1 plus x. Now I have four options for v. What I need to do is I just need to check del V by del Y because these two are equal, right? I have to check all the four options A, B, C and D and see which option is giving me 1 plus X. It seems only option A. What was option A? Option A was Y plus XY. Option A was Y plus XY. So if you do a del del Y of this, you will get del del Y of Y is 1 and del del Y of X, Y is X. Only option A was giving me the right answer. That's why option A is correct. Okay, you don't need to do the formal way. Now is this correct? Uh, is this okay with you? Can I move to the next question? The one who asked me to repeat. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, having said this, now you know the Cauchy Riemann equation. Can you just give an attempt to this question, please? If you forgot, I'll write the Cauchy Riemann equation again. Del u by del x is equal to del v by del y and del u by del y is equal to minus del v by del x. These are the Cauchy Riemann equation. Which of the following is an analytic function of the complex variable z in the domain mod z less than 2? That means there is a domain that which is a circle of radius 2. Inside this, which of the functions are analytic? That means which of the functions will be differentiable with respect to z? D, sir. Option? D. Option D. Who is this? Sandeep, sir. Oh, sorry, Sandeep. I forgot your voice. No problem. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Sandeep is saying option D. Reason, Sandeep? Uh, because it contains no Z bar. So I know this trick. By you know this trick? Okay, good. But tell me one thing. Mm, yes, sir. 
it contains no z bar but there is more than that you need to know so do you think only d does not contain z bar everything else contains z bar look at the options properly sandeep i appreciate yeah. your trick but you are missing some other options which also does yeah. not contain by z that bar. logic uh, option b is also not contain option b is also a possibility yes so no. yeah b and d 50 50 good uh, in that way c is also not containing no. z bar no 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 yes it is not containing z bar but it is neither containing z yeah so uh -huh. you need uh, little knowledge is dangerous right so you need to know certain more conditions to this i am glad that i'll be able to complete that today and i hope that will be for a lifetime anybody else see discussing all these questions in proper details actually takes one class itself so today we'll be just i mean touching upon the things because we have to do many other problems anybody else satyabrat are you there you have been silent Yeah, Satya, are you there? Yeah. Any answers? Kiran, any answers? See, okay, one thing is sure by looking at this. powers by looking at this powers one thing is sure that you cannot use the cauchy riemann equation directly okay because how are you going to do this are you going to uh, expand this and separate the real and imaginary parts and write it in the form of u plus iv then put into this equation by this time by the time you do this you will take half an hour for doing that okay so in other words when the examiner has put this question in csir that he is indirectly telling you asking you do you know the trick or not okay because you cannot afford to waste half an hour in checking these things okay the trick is this if any complex function contains only z or positive integer powers of z that means if it contains z or positive integer powers of z that means z1 z2 z3 and so on then it will be analytic in nature this is quite obvious right sandeep because if it is b? yes option is b b option is b it's not d i'll tell you why it is okay so if it contains either z or some positive powers of z okay integer powers let's say z q then this will be 3z square and so on then it will be analytic in nature but if it contains other terms like uh, z bar if it contains terms like z bar which is equal to x minus i y then this is not going to be analytic why because if you put into cauchy riemann equation del u by del x will be 1 and del u by del y will be minus 1 it is not satisfied okay z bar is not a possibility if it contains only only x that means the real part of z then also del u by del x will be 1 and the other part will be 0 this is also not equal so in other words we want the function only to contain z or positive integer powers of z okay so please uh, see uh, when i'll be sending you the without annotation slide please note this statement carefully okay if your complex function contains only z or positive integers okay positive integers means you can say natural numbers then it will be analytic in nature but if it contains terms like uh, complex conjugate of z modulus of z 
real part of z, imaginary part of z, then it will be non-analytic in nature. If you know this statement, you have saved your time. Within 10-15 seconds, you will be able to give the answer. Now, let us analyze the options. This option, what is the problem? It is containing x minus i, y. Means what? This is z bar. So, this is not possible. This is containing what? This is minus bracket x plus i, y. So, this is z, not a problem. This will be, if you take, uh, if you break this into minus x, minus x, then minus y. This is also minus common x plus i, y. This also z. But one x is left out. This will create the problem. One x is left out. X means what? X is nothing but the real part of z, isn't it? So, it is just containing real part of z. So, this is also gone. What about this? As Sandeep said, this is containing z only. But it is containing power to the half. I mean, the power is half. In such cases also, this won't be analytic. It has to be integer powers. Only this, this is 1 plus z to the power 4 and 1 minus z to the power 3. Whatever you do, if you expand also, you will only see that either constants are there or z power n is there. Okay, so this will be analytic. So are you able to appreciate this trick? Will you remember this trick? How we have, how somebody has come to the trick, let's not worry about now. Okay, for now, our aim is to qualify this examination. As of now, please try to understand this trick. Okay, derivation, you please leave it for now. Is it okay? Sir, if the power is minus 2, minus 3, like this, then? Then no. Okay. I'm saying positive integer powers. If it is minus 2, minus 3, then it won't be analytic. Okay. Okay. So if I now give you something, 1 plus twice x, 1 plus, twi 1 plus twice x minus uh, i 2y to the power 7, will it be analytic? It will not be analytic. Why? Because it contains 2z bar. Something like this, you remember. Okay. This statement, you please note this when I send you the without annotation slide. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Similar, this you can, you please don't take your pen and paper for this. Just look at the options and give me an answer. If you have understood the previous slide. It is saying not, and there is only one option. You just move your eyes to the options and if you will easily detect one. D. D. Yes, D. Very good. Very good. D. Okay. Why D? Because once C, only one option is correct and you asked not a complex analytic function. So this contains Z bar. That's it. Option D. You don't need to look at the others. Okay. If you have time, if you have time, then you can look. This is Z. What is this? This is Z square, right? Because this is x square plus i i i y whole square plus twice i x y. That means that is x plus i y whole square. That means that is z square. That's possible. Z minus z. What is this? This again z square. Okay. Everything, every each of the other options contains z or z square. But this contains z bar. Okay. So if you know that statement, you are already ahead of people who are going to use the conventional cauchy riemann equation to solve this problem and they will get stuck okay and you will be ahead of them is this fine everybody can we move to the next topic okay great okay now let's come to another sort of the topic in net which is cauchy's integral theorem uh, this question says the value of the integral the integral is about this c c is this one okay c is this one this is C. dz, z square e to the power z, where C is an open contour in the complex z plane. Complex z plane means this is the real axis and this is the imaginary axis. What will be the value of this integration? Integration this to this. Okay. What you have to use is, I have given you the concept here. Okay, I have already, option has come before. Animation problem. Anyway, this is the 
think Cauchy's integral theorem it states that if f z is an analytic function in a simply connected region r, simply connected region r means there are no poles or something in this region, then a closed integration of f z dz is equal to zero. Okay, closed contour. So that means for that function, if you do an integration over a closed curve, okay, then it is equal to zero. Now, can you do this and try to see whether you're getting option C? What it is saying is it's a simply connected region. This is also a simply connected region, but this C is not closed. This C is not closed. Okay. So from this theorem, you know that if it was closed, then the total integration is zero. Okay. For the closed contour, the total integration is zero. But you have to find what is the integration from for this. How are you going to do this? Okay, let's go ahead with this. So what this Cauchy's integral theorem says, if fz is an analytic function, okay? Firstly, we have to check whether it is an analytic function or not. z square e to the power z. That's an analytic function. Analytic function means the derivatives with respect to z will be existing. So this you can keep on deriving, right? It is an analytic function, okay? So that means the closed integration, the closed integration of fz dz will be equal to zero. Okay. Now we can separate this into two parts. One will be along this contour C. Along this contour C, it will be fz dz plus. I hope you know this that uh, breaking of the part integration into two parts. From this to this and from this, you usually used to do this, right? Minus infinity to infinity is equal to what? Minus infinity to zero plus zero to infinity. This kind of things you have been doing from class 11, right? Same thing I'm doing. So this part is done. The next part is what? From this to this. From this to this, okay? So that will be from minus one to one. And since I'm only dealing... Uh, with the x axis. So, no problem. I can write it as z square e to the power z. That means fz dz. Are you able to understand this particular step? Let me know. Yes or no. I have just broken into two parts. The total integration is zero. So, the sum of these two parts will be zero. Okay. Yes. Are you understanding this part? There is a theorem which says that the total closed integration is zero. So I have just broken that into the upper half and the lower half and claiming this is zero. So what is asked in the question is this part. So the answer to this part is nothing but minus of minus one to one z square e to the power z dz. That's it. Okay. So. Uh, how to do this? Okay, again, your screen will be gone. Okay, I'll be just adding one uh, more slide. Okay, let me see if I have some blank slides somewhere. Yes, okay. So the answer is minus of minus one to one fz dz. That is equal to minus of minus one to one z square e to the power z dz. Are you able to understand up to this point? Please tell me yes or no. Hmm? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, how are we going to do this? This will be integration by parts. Okay. So we'll put the limits later. I'm just for the ease of calculation. So this will be. Th there are two functions. Okay. 
we'll put the exponential function as a second function because this is an algebraic function. So this will be z square integration of e to the power z. Integration of e to the power z is nothing but e to the power z. Okay. Then minus. I hope you remember this integration by parts thing. Okay. Uh, first function integration of second function minus derivative of first, first function into integration of second function. Integration by parts, you please revise if you don't remember. So next will be integration of the derivative of this. What is the derivative of this? This is twice z. And then the integration of this will be again e to the power z. Okay. Worrying about the limits later. This will be minus sign is there. Z square e to the power z. This is again two functions, product of two functions. We again have to use the integration by parts. So this will be 2z e to the power z. Then this is a minus, and that minus and this minus will become plus. Uh, this will be 2. Derivative of z will be 1. So this will be integration of e to the power z, that is e to the power z. Okay, the limits were minus 1 to 1. Okay, so I have done integration by parts two times. Okay, so let's uh, put the things. So let's put one here. So this will be z square is one. So e minus two uh, e plus two e, isn't it? This will be e minus. Uh, 2e plus 2e, okay? And then we have to put this minus 1. So I'll do a minus, okay? Let's put a bracket here, minus of. If I put minus 1 here, minus 1 square is 1, and it will be e to the power minus 1. That means 1 by e. Then there is a minus sign. Then if I put minus here, this will become plus 2 by e, okay? Then there is a plus here e to the power minus 1 is 2 by e. I hope you're noting this down. So 2e, 2e will be cancelled. So this will be minus e minus 5 by e. So the answer will be 5 by e minus e. So let's see whether this is the answer or not. 5 by e minus e. So have you noted this down? We can just come back. Yes, it's 5 by e minus e. Okay, so the basic thing about this problem is you are asked to find this, that this, this is nothing but the negative of this, and this is a straightforward integration which you can do by parts. Only thing that you need to know is this particular theorem, which is called as Cauchy's integral theorem. Okay, if this is a simply connected region, then it's closed integration for an analytic function is going to be zero. Okay, you frequently see these kind of questions in your examinations. Okay. Those who have appeared for a couple of times will know. Okay, so having said this, please try this by yourself. Okay, no, no, but this requires your cautious residue theorem. Okay, what does the residue theorem says? The initial one, it was a fully connected region. There were no poles. But what if there are poles which are results of singularities in this? So how you are you going to do this? It's given by this theorem. Let's read this. If C is a simple closed positively oriented, positively oriented means it refers to the anti-clockwise. Uh, your motion is anti-clockwise. That means in the previous question, if you see, this is positively oriented because you are going anti-clockwise. If you're going clockwise, it will be negatively oriented and so on. Positively oriented contour in the complex plane and F is an analytic. It is analytic, but except in some points, inside the contour. That means if I have a function like x cubed plus 5 divided by x minus y, this function is analytic in the in the space except when x equal to 1, where this will stop to be analytic. Okay, so except certain points like this, then the integration, then the contour integration, yes, which is the answer? A. A, okay, let's see. It will be 2 pi i into some of the residues. And how do you calculate the residue? 
it is given by this formula. That means, and here, A is the order of the pole. In this case, the order of the pole is 1. If it was x minus 2 whole cube, then there is a pole at 1 and the order is k is equal to 3 because it is x minus 1 whole cube. Okay. So for pole of order 1, how will the residue look like? This will be 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 factorial is 1. So and k minus 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. So it will be simply z minus z naught into f of z. The residue is going to look like that. Limit z tends to z naught. This is how the residue will look like. In case of a pole of order 2, how will this look like? It's going to be equal to ddz of z minus z naught whole square f of z limit z tends to z naught. This is how your poles are going to look like. Okay. So you need to just note these two things that the integration is nothing but 2 pi i into sum of the residues. And how do you calculate the residues? If it is order 1, you have to calculate this. If it is of order 2, you have to calculate this. Okay, now you let us see uh, this expression. Okay, by the way, somebody told it's A. Yes, the answer is A. I think Mossam told this. Okay, now what will be the poles for this? The po this is nothing but Z minus 3 into Z minus 2, isn't it? It is Z minus 3 into Z minus 2. If you factorize this expression. So it has two poles. One pole is 3. That means it has two poles. One pole is three. Sir. Yes. Yes. Tell me. Somebody was saying something. Three and two are two poles. Yes. Sir. Yes. Three and two are two poles. Yes. That's what I'm saying. So these are the two poles. Okay. Now we need to calculate the residues. Okay. But there is something more to this, where C is a closed contour defined by the equation this one. 2 mod of Z minus 5 is equal to 0. 2 mod of Z minus 5 is equal to 0. That means Z is equal to 2.5. So when you say mod of Z is equal to 2.5, that means what? You are talking about a circular region whose radius is 2.5. So that means out of the two poles, we don't need to worry about this pole. Why? Because this will not be a pole. Why? Because we are only considering this region. 2 will be here and 3 will be here because this radius is 2.5. So this is not going to be a pole in this region. Okay. So our only pole is Z is equal to 2. We have only one pole and it is of order 1. So you have to use this formula. That means what we have to do is limit z tends to z naught, that is 3, z minus 3 into this one, z cube, z minus 2, z minus 3. And your z minus 3 and z minus 3 are going to get cancelled. Once you put the limit z tends to 3, what will happen? This will be, sorry, z tends to, sorry, this will be 2. So this will be 3, okay? Limit, because the pole is at 2, not at 3. So 2 cube will be equal to 8, and 2 minus 3 will be equal to minus 1. So the residue is minus 8. And there are only one pole. So the sum of the residue means the residue of that pole only. So 2 pi i into minus 8. That is going to give you 16 pi i with a negative sign. Okay, I'm just repeating things. I had an expression like this, okay? When I uh, factorize this, I get z minus 3 and z minus 2. By looking at my domain, by looking at my domain, I realized that 3 will be out of the domain, so we did not worry about this. 2 will be inside the domain. We need to worry about this. 2 is a pole of the first order, so the residue will be given by this formula, z minus 2 into fz. So what will get the residue to be minus 8? Then we need to do is, 2 pi i into sum of the residue. Since there is only one residue, it will be 2 pi i into minus 8 will get this as the answer. Is this clear to you? Mossam, is this the way that you have done or you have some better way? Yes. 
like this way. Yes, but do you have any better Hello. way to do this? Yes, yes, I can hear you, Mosum. Tell me. No, sir, like this way only. Okay, okay, fine. Okay. Okay, one more last problem on Cauchy's residual theorem. The contour integral given by dz1 plus z square evaluated along a contour going from minus infinity to infinity. Okay, it is going from minus infinity to infinity in the real axis and closed in the lower half plane circle. That means something like you are going this way and you are going this way is equal to what? Okay, Sandeep, you cannot guess here because this is fill in the blanks. Okay, give me an answer. Let's see who gets it first. Every year, questions are asked on residue theorem, Cauchy's integral theorem, complex analysis, some questions on metrics. So, uh, out of 200 marks, sometimes mathematical physics alone captures 40 marks. And if you know the topics well that I'm covering in today's class, there is a chance that out of 40, you will get 20. Keeping in mind that you need 100 for qualification out of 200. Contour. Contour means what? It's kind of a curve. 3.14. Yes, Sandeep. Minus 3.14. Minus 3.14. Very good. Anybody else? That means minus pi, right, Sandeep? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Sandeep, dil pe le liyo, kya? I told guess. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. No. Sir. Okay. Any? Okay, okay. Anybody else? Any other answers? The plus pi. Plus pi. Sandeep, how are you going to defend to Mosum? Yes, the plus pi. Huh? Let me Sandeep. check my answer. Yeah. <laughs> Those who are confused between pi and pi, minus pi, let me show you something. I think I have written something here which is positively oriented. Okay, this is the hint, which is going to resolve your conflict between Sandeep and Mosum. Minus one. Hmm? Again, Mosum, you are changing. I think minus pi. You think minus pi? Because pie? it's... Uh... Okay. See, computer is going to check. Even if you have done all the hard work and got this, and if the answer was this, you get zero. Good thing is that you'll not get negative marks, but all your efforts will be wasted. If it is three marks, you'll get zero if you do a plus minus mistake. Anybody else? Is there anybody who is thinking that they are fighting between minus pi and plus pi? My answer is plus 50. Is anybody in this situation? Okay, let me try. See, uh, firstly, the function is 1 plus z square, isn't it? 
तो वन प्लस जेड स्क्वायर मींस इट इज डी जेड डिवाइड बाय वन प्लस आई सॉरी इट विल बी जेड प्लस आई एंड जेड माइनस आई इज इंट इट सो दैट विल बी जेड स्क्वायर माइनस आई स्क्वायर दैट इज विल जेड स्क्वायर प्लस वन यस दिस इज सो देर आर टू लाइक सिंगुलरिटीज व्हिच आर व्हेन जेड इज इक्वल ट� and z is equal to minus i now in the question it is said that you are going to the lower half plane you are going to the lower half plane okay you are going to the lower half plane that means see this is the negative axis uh, this is the imaginary axis right this will be i and i will be in this side and minus i will be in this side see always remember in a complex plane this is the real number axis this is the negative number or imaginary number axis okay so plus i will be here minus i will be here so we don't need to worry about the plus i thing why we don't need, because on the minus i can be a pole here because we are taking the contour in the negative in the downside okay so this is our pole okay how to find a residue residue is limit z tends to minus i z minus z not into One divided by z plus i into z minus i. Okay, so this is z plus i. It is going to be cancelled with this. Okay, so this will be minus i, right? So this will be minus i minus i. That is minus two i. So the residue at the pole is minus two i. Okay, residue at the pole is minus two i. so the sum of the residue is uh, the integ sum of the the integration is the sum of the residue 2 pi i into sum of the residue that is 1 by minus 2 i okay but the problem is it is 2 pi i into sum of the residues when when it is positively oriented positively oriented means what it is anti clockwise but this is clockwise had it been this way this would have been positively oriented means what anti clockwise but this is clockwise are you getting so when it is clockwise or negatively oriented there is a minus sign in here so this will be 2 2 cancel i i cancel answer is only pi okay that's the answer see the trick they have applied they are even testing you whether you are careful about the orientation or not this is not a tough problem if you know how to calculate the residues if you know the integral theorem it's a easy problem but are you even noticing whether it's a clockwise or anti clockwise movement are you guys able to understand this to this problem what i'm i want to tell you is this please note how your contour is moving is it moving anti clockwise then give a positive if it is moving clockwise then give a negative sign before 2 pi i into sum of the residues are you getting this can i move to the next question Yes. So again, explain okay. how it is anti-clockwise. Yes. Which one? So why we are applying negative? So I can't get it. See, uh, the theorem says it is two pi i into sum of residues when your contour contour means what? It's a curve. It's a closed curve. but it will have some direction if it is going anti clockwise if it is going anti clockwise then give a plus sign if your contour is going clockwise then give a minus sign that part you understand right yes sir now now in this curve this is your real axis this is your imaginary axis in the question it is said that you are going from where are you going you are going from minus infinity you are going from minus infinity to infinity that means you are going from minus infinity to infinity so one direction is given in the question that is this now you have to go back to the starting point right only then your curve will be closed there are two ways of going one is to the upper half plane one is to the lower half plane the question also specifies this that is the lower half plane so the only way of going to the lower half plane is how you have to go to this way okay that means you are going this way that means your motion is like this now if i ask you to choose between clockwise and anti clockwise for this motion how will you choose 
isn't this clockwise? Isn't this how the clock, hand of the clock moves? Yes, 1 PM, sir. 2 PM, 3. That's how it, that's why it is clockwise. Now is it clear? Yes, sir. Clear, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Great. Okay, I think I have one more. I think this is the last of this evaluation of integrals. And this is really an interesting one. So, uh, Oh, see, when this principal value is like uh, when your integration is such that it's going up to infinity, then uh, we take the principal value, which is a method for assigning values to certain improper integrals. Improper integrals means which are diverging integrals, which whose value is infinity kind of thing, which should otherwise be undefined. I'm giving an example. Let's say one by z. Okay. So in such case, or let's say one by z square, whatever. This is not defined as z is equal to zero, right? This is not defined as z is equal to zero. So in such case, what you do is you may do something like minus infinity to epsilon one by z square. Sorry, minus infinity to minus epsilon plus epsilon to infinity one by z square. That means you are kind of avoiding the zero. You are avoiding the zero part and calculate for the calculating for the other part. Okay, limit epsilon tends to zero. So such things are called principal value, okay? So now can you try doing this using the same uh, residue pose thing? Okay, uh, we, are, we may be running out of time, so I'll just start with the solution to this. See, you may be tempted to take x equal to zero as a pole, okay? But there is a problem here. If you take x equal to zero as a pole, sign the numerator also becomes zero. It takes this kind of form, zero by zero. Okay. So we have to apply a trick here. Instead of taking this as the function, we have to take e to the power uh, e to the power i to x e to the power i to x by x cube and evaluate this integral. Why? Because now if I put x equal to 0, this does not become 0. This becomes 1, isn't it? So let's that's, that's make our uh, method valid. Okay. So we are avoiding this. Instead of doing this, I am putting this. Now what's the good thing about this? e to the power i theta is nothing but cos theta plus i sin theta, de Moivre's theorem. Okay. So whenever we in integrate this particular in integral instead of this, whatever the answer we get, if we take the imaginary part of that answer, don't you think we'll get the answer for this? We are not, we are out of method to evaluate this because it is taking some zero by zero form. Okay. So instead of this, I'm doing this e to the power i theta, which is cos theta plus i sin theta. So whatever answer we get for this, we just need to take the imaginary part of that so that the imaginary part of that is sin theta. That means imaginary part of this will be sin 2x. So that is going to give me an answer for this. Are you able to understand this point? This is very crucial. Instead of sin theta, I am writing e to the power i theta. And when I get an answer for this, the answer for this will have a real part and an imaginary part. I'll just take the extract the imaginary part of this and I'll get the actual answer. Okay. Not following this. Okay. Sir. Okay. So uh, e to the power i to z divided by z cube dz. I need to evaluate this integral. Okay. So what I have to do is I have a pole of order three at z is equal to zero. So how will my residue look like? It will be one by k minus one. That means three minus one. That is two factorial. One by two factorial limit z tends to zero. Then dd k minus one. That means k minus one is three minus one. That is two. It will be d square by d z square. This formula I've already written there. Okay. In one of the previous slides, I'm just applying the formula. This is nothing rocket science. Okay. This will be uh, z minus 0, z minus 0 cube into e to the power i 2z 
divide by z cube. So z cube and z cube will get cancelled. You are left with e to the power i two z, the second derivative of this. Okay. So what will be the second derivative of this? This will be equal to half of. If you take a first derivative, it will be e to the power i two z. But uh, something will come out that is two i. Okay. Again, if you take one more derivative, one more two i will come. So it will be four i square. So this will be minus four, minus four of. It will be minus four of e to the power i to z. And when you put z is equal to tens to zero, this will going to be one. So the residue is minus two. The residue is minus two. So uh, so this will be two pi i sum of the residues. So that is going to be equal to minus four pi i. So the answer, okay, wait. I think there is a two factor mismatch somewhere. Can you please? Yes, Mosam. That's a sign. Sign two e. There will be one half is coming. Two factorial is uh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. Got it. So this will be equal to uh, what you think? Factorial two is two only. Most of you are saying something. Yes, I think I missed out that. No, say that one is not here. Something. I also get sir minus four by first. You know, I, I got the same sir minus four by iota. See the uh, residue is going to be uh, minus two, right? Yes, sir. Residue is same. Sir, uh, that that one I told you that sir. Mm-hmm. Awesome. What you're saying? The sine. The sin x is equal to e to the power i x minus e to the power minus i x by two. That two. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So, uh, but then this will be cos two uh, x plus i sine two x. Mm. But what's wrong with this? This should also be fine, right? Okay. Anyway, uh, what Mosam is suggesting is. I can break up this into sine theta is equal to e to the power i theta minus e to the power minus i theta divided by twice i. That's what you are suggesting, also. Awesome. No, but yes, then sir. this way also it should be right. Sir, by that, ah, it yes. is zero. Hmm? If we break it in form of exponential. In two hmm. parts, so same way we are getting zero. Like this way we are getting something, but that way we are getting zero again. Zero, right? Okay, yes. Uh, okay, so now we got minus four pi i, minus four pi i from this, e to the power i theta. What is the answer given is a minus two pi. Imaginary part of this is okay. We are just getting a two factor mismatch, right? I mean, the rest is coming okay. We are getting a two factor mismatch. Yes, sir. Okay. Anyway, uh, so uh, I'll just uh, work on this and send the solution in the slides along with the slides that I'm going to send. Okay. But the procedure is this only. Okay. Somewhere some two factor is mismatch. Okay. Let's not waste more time on this. We have more problems to do. OK. OK, now let's come to another interesting part that is metrics and determinants. So the most sought after questions in this is eigenvalues question. OK, you will be given a matrix and you'll be asked a whole lot of questions for eigenvalues. OK, uh, yes. What are the eigenvalues of this? Can you uh, do this without doing much of calculations? The general way of doing this is what? Uh, it's the characteristic equation, right? Or option C. Yes. Uh, how do you do this? 
it is of the format a b b a so a plus b a minus b and the other one will be just one okay it's yes. wait 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 other one will be just one okay you mean to say yes. two plus three two two plus three and two minus three will be two eigenvalues and the other one since it's of that format it will be just okay. one Okay, are you sure that works for all other matrices? That's a nice thing. I am also learning. That means if you have a only B, if it's of this format, yeah, a b b a. That means this particular and yeah, everything yeah, is zero yeah. zero one, right? Because yeah. this itself yeah. is a matrix. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All of you, please learn. What is your name? Thanks for this. Ida, sir. Okay. It's better to so, go for trace and determinant. It will be. Actually, good. You said trace and determine will be okay. Quite trace easy. and determine. Okay, but uh, this also makes sense to me. I think I have I yeah. have come this across this point. Helpful. of what? Yeah, yeah. This will also be helpful in perturbation theory. Yes. Okay. Fine. I think I have come across this somewhere, but right now I'm not remembering the exact. But I think I have come across this. Okay. The other way is trace and determinant. We know two things. The option is by the way C. See the conventional way is this. Those who forgot every trick, just spend some of your time and do this. This is the matrix A. This is the eigenvalue lambda, and this is the identity matrix. That means solve this determinant: two minus lambda three zero three, uh, two minus lambda and zero 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 one minus lambda. Solve this determinant equal to zero and find the values of lambda. That is a very conventional way, but it's going to take some time. The other thing is that, uh. For a matrix, the trace is going to give you the sum of the eigenvalues, isn't it? Sum of the eigenvalues, and the determinant is going to give you the product of the eigenvalues. Okay, these two things, if you remember, it's very easy for you. Now, in this question, if you see what is the trace, trace means the sum of the diagonal elements. This is two plus two plus one, that is five. So, uh, we are not very lucky in this question because this. Is also giving us five. This is also giving us five. But these two options are ruled out because this is giving you minus seven, and this is giving you minus three. These two options are ruled out. You are left with this. But then you have to find a determinant. How do you find a determinant of this? There is uh, one way which I know to find determinants which leads to less error. Okay, and sometimes it is less time consuming also. Maybe some of you know this, but for those who don't know, it will be a good learning. I just repeat the last two lines of this matrix, 3, 2, 0. What I've done is I've written the matrix as it is and repeated the first two lines at the bottom. Okay, 2, 3, 0. Then I draw cross lines like this. Okay. Then I multiply the numbers in the line. 2 into 2 into 1 is 2. There is 0. So it will be 0. There is 0. It will be 0. This is also going to be zero. This is also going to be zero, and this is going to be equal to three into three is nine. So what is the value of this determinant? Is this add this up? You add this up, right hand side minus left hand side. That is, uh, sorry, this will be two into two. That is four. Four minus nine. That is equal to minus five. Okay, this is how you find a value of a determinant. This is a way of doing that. Repeat the last two lines. Draw cross lines. Three cross lines on either sides. Multiply the numbers on the lines. Add them up. Multiply the number of the on the left. Add them up and do right minus left. So four minus nine is five. So the value of the determinant is five. So next you see which options are giving you five. Five into two into minus two. What is that? That is minus twenty. Five into one into minus one. What is that? That is minus five. So this is the right answer. Okay. So for this in uh, eigenvalues generally. Most of your problems will be solved using this. Uh, examiner in a competitive exam is seldom going to give you questions where you need to do this. Okay, they just going to check whether you know these two things. The trace of a matrix is going to be equal to the sum of the eigenvalues, and the determinant is equal to the product of the eigenvalues. And determinant, if possible, use this trick. Okay, because the other thing, two into this minus this. Uh, the problem here is that it is not only time consuming. Students do a plus minus mistake in this. When we check copies in the, of your examination, we find that 
people do a plus minus error somewhere and you get something else. There, there is no chance of plus minus mistake. You are doing it graphically. Okay, pictorially you are doing this, there is less chance of mistakes using this. Okay, so this will be five, one and minus one. Are you able to see this? Can I go to the next question? Or do you want me to repeat this? Any part of this question? Yes, sir. yes means what? For going ahead or repeating? Next question. Sir. Next question. Okay. See, if some of you are having any confusion, please speak up. Okay. Just because somebody has said next question, don't mean you cannot stop me. You can stop me anytime. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Similar question. Easy one. Gate came in gate. Trace is 11 and determinant is 36, means what? Sum of lambda is 11, sum of uh, product of lambda is 36. The eigenvalues of the matrix are all known to be positive integers. The largest eigenvalue of the matrix is what? Six, sir. Six, good. So, firstly, what you have to do is you have to break 11 into three numbers, okay? Such that their product is equal to 36. See, one way of breaking this is 9, 1, 1. What is the product? 9. So, this is not equal to 36. What else you can You have to keep trying, okay? But from your experience, you may start with a better guess. Let's say, firstly, when you say trace is 11, these two are automatically ruled out, right? These two are automatically ruled out. Why I have started with 9, do you know? Because there is an option 9 here. And if you say 9 here, there is only one possibility. Why? Because they are saying positive integer. 0 is not a positive integer. So the only positive integers left is 1, 1. And this is not giving an answer. That's it. You don't need to go further. This is your option. Are you able to see what I have done? By looking at this, okay. I have directly ruled out this. One option is 9. Let me check with 9. 9 only one possibility, 1, 1. So let me six, check with 6. 6 into uh, 11. What are the possibilities? 6 Eight. into 3 into 2. 6 into 3 into 2. 6 plus 3 is 9. 9 plus 2 is 11. And 6 into 3 into 2 is 6 into 6. That is 36. So the greatest of them will be 6. But generally, I told you about one thing in the, pre, uh, in the beginning, in the first lecture, redundancy. That means whenever you are done, your mind will tell, let me verify, let me verify, no need to verify. Because based on logic, you are ruling, you have ruled out all the options. Okay, no need to see whether it is actually working for six. It has to work or else the question is wrong. Okay, if you have time, you please verify like this. I have done, but not in the first round. Okay, this is interesting. Sir, D, one. Option, option D, okay. What is your name? Aida. Is this the spelling? Yes, sir. Okay, Aida has told option D. Others, please endorse this or reject this, saying that this is this can't be an answer. Option D, 
ऑप्शन डी किरण ऑप्शन मौसम ऑप्शन डी ओके सो या ऑप्शन डी राइट फाइन सो फॉर अदर्स प्लीज हैव अ लुक वन थिंग यू नो फ्रॉम फॉर श्योर दैट what is the sum of the eigen values of this that is equal to a sum that means lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 will be equal to a okay so that means now one more thing that you need to know is i have written it here if a matrix m has eigen values a b c and so on then the matrix m square will have eigen values a square b square c square and so on m cube will have eigen values a cube b cube c cube and e to the power m will have eigen values e to the power a e to the power b e to the power c and so on okay these lines please remember it will come very handy in your examinations now e to the power a is having an eigen value e to the power small a that means what one of the eigen values of this matrix has to be equal to a this information is derived from this point now we told that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is equal to a if lambda 1 itself is equal to a that means lambda 2 plus lambda 3 will be equal to 0 okay now if lambda 2 and lambda 3 are eigen values of this matrix then e to the power lambda 1 and e to the power lambda 2 will be eigen values of this matrix this is coming from this point okay the product of the other two eigen values means what is this is equal to e to the power lambda 1 sorry it is lambda 2 into lambda 3 the product of the other two eigen values will be equal to this but lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is equal to 0 so e to the power 0 is 1 getting all of you all 35 or 36 of you are you at least getting some feeling that we will be able to do this uh, crack this examinations all these are previous year questions only this is the standard that is asked for all they are expecting is that you go beyond the conventions you go beyond the conventions and apply certain tricks saving your time how many of you are getting a feeling that we will be able to make this examinations Sandeep, where are you? I am watching, sir. Okay, okay, <laughs> good. Yes, no. But sir, I have one query or some. Yes, What yes. Please feel free. These questions are uh, before two thousand nineteen. That means these were. come from offline examinations mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. when i in my opinion mm -hmm. when i see the previous 3 years question mm -hmm. means uh, when the net exam starts online mode mm -hmm. then the level or pattern of the exam has changed so okay. rarely these types of questions are these types of asked but uh, mm -hmm. the almost changed so that's why i feel i matlab isse zyada kuch padhna alag dekhna padega okay i accept this i accept this thank you for this uh like the what i am trying to do here is not like about how many questions or how many syllabus or what part of the syllabus i am covering all i am trying to tell you is that the non conventional way of thinking about these questions the pattern may change the type of question but see certain things won't change if you can give me a question paper i can show you the similarity okay yes uh, the level may go high but what i'm what we are trying to do in this workshop is that to analyze all these questions and see how you can think smarter in all these questions that is the one thing i want you to take this are you getting this what are we are doing Ha, I mean, uh, I cannot teach you everything, and I frankly speaking, I don't know many things. Okay, and none of us know many many things. That's okay. But you, as an aspirant, you have to think in lines of how things can be done better and smarter. Okay. See, every time is going to get changed. After three four years, is going to get changed. That is normal. Okay. 
but certain basic things that if you see the syllabus that is more or less same okay and see people are growing more and more intelligent right so the level will definitely go higher and higher okay uh, the if, even if you see the board exams the kind of ranks you get in the state for 90 percent now you don't even get that for 99 percent people have to grow intelligent why because the amount of research that is done up to now you have to build on top of that isn't it so people have to grow more and more intelligent that is expected but all i want to take is that take uh, all i want your take away for this workshop is that you please think of getting to the solutions in a more easy manner using less pen and paper using less pen and paper that's the thing i want you to take okay rest everything will be taken care of if you are doing long yes, long sir. derivations in your csr exams you are bound to fail okay anyway uh, we'll talk on this last one or two questions easy ones possible set of eigenvalues P trace is six, so you cannot rule out anything. This is six. This is six. This is six. This is six. But m square is twenty six. This is one plus. This is not possible. One square. This is not possible. This is possible. This is also not possible. This you don't need to analyze. Okay. So option is C. Why? Because trace of m square means what? Lambda one square plus lambda two square plus lambda three square is equal to twenty six. Okay, so one square is one plus nine plus sixteen is equal to twenty six. So this is an option. None of these other options satisfy this equation, which is lambda one square plus lambda two square plus lambda three square is equal to twenty six. Okay. Last question. I am guessing answer A. <laughs> you are guessing answer A. You have become an expert guesser now. Good. Look at the question and make right guesses. Is the answer A? Yes, answer A. For this, you remember this line. If all the other rows of a matrix are constant times multiples, uh, English, uh, okay, no problem. Of one row, then the eigenvalues will be trace of the matrix, rest all will be zero. Okay. Now, how will this matrix look like? It is saying that all the elements are the product of the positions i into j, x position and y position. So the first will be 1, 1, that is 1. Second will be 1, 2, that is 2. Third will be 1, 3, that is 3. This will be 2, 1, that is 2. This will be 2, 2, that is 4. This will be 2, 3, that is 6. Next will be three, six, nine, and so on. Okay. Now what I'm saying here is if all the other rows of a matrix are constant multiples of one row, you see in this matrix, this is a constant multiple of this row into two. This is a constant multiple of this row into three. Okay. And you also know that in a matrix, we can always replace a particular row by uh, let's say row one minus half of row two. You can do things like operations like this, right? To get equivalent matrices. So this will be all zero, 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 and so on. So that's the logic behind saying that only one independent row we have, rest are all dependent. For them, we get all zeros. And for the independent row, what we get, 
is the trace. Why the trace? Because all other eigenvalues are zero. Okay. And we know that the sum of the eigenvalues is equal to the trace. Okay. So this will be the non zero eigenvalue. Okay. So in short, if you remember this statement, for such cases, so such matrices, the eigenvalues are the trace and rest everything is zero. Okay. So for this, uh, what is given is has one degenerate eigenvalue with degeneracy n minus one. Yes, because this one is a non degenerate. What is degenerate? Degenerate eigenvalue means eigenvalues which are repeating. Let's say 3, comma 3. That means 3 is a degenerate eigenvalue with degeneracy equal to 2. 3, comma 3, comma 3. That means 3 is a degenerate eigenvalue with degeneracy equal to 3. So in this case, 0 is that degenerate eigenvalue with degeneracy equal to n minus 1. And the remaining this is a non degenerate. So only this option is satisfying this. Are you able to see? Are you able to understand this? Will you, uh, will you remember this line? Anybody who didn't understand this question? Everybody silent. Sir. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, since uh, okay, we have a session regarding which one, which one book we should follow. Or mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, since you are uh, teaching this topic, hmm. so can you tell us from where we can find these types of tricks, or we just think to ourselves to about these tricks? See. Uh, Learn from everywhere. Firstly, many of the tricks while I was a student, while I was doing this, that came to me automatically that, okay, this can be done in this way. Okay. Some of the tricks or, many, or rather many of the tricks, these are available in YouTube or many other platforms. Okay. Books generally tell you about the conventional way. If you take any mathematical physics book, they are more into teaching you the conventional way of doing things. Okay. And some of the tricks may come from properties. Let's say these are nothing but properties of eigenvalues. Okay. So, but uh, regarding this, whenever you get some free time, go, uh, Google about some tricks in this particular topic, you may learn new. Okay. And uh, from your friend circle also, if you make some close friend circle, we used to do that and try studying in groups, then tricks used to automatically come up. Some of in some of the minds, like uh, some tricks used to come up saying that this can be done in this way also. This is what I suggest. But yes, there are books available which says tricks in mathematical physics or tricks and tips in mathematical physics. You can search for them as well. Okay, basically you search from all sources. But in YouTube, there are many people giving many, many tricks. Okay, please go through them and like see what you can learn from them. Okay, but I cannot tell you any definite source that go to this particular person and learn. I mean, in this age, it is not advisable to do that because learning can be done from everywhere. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. One small question was left. I forgot about this. Okay, which of the following? Cannot be the eigenvalues of the real three cost three matrix. You have a three cost D. three matrix, huh? D. D. Yes, sorry, D. 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 Yes, because you know that if it is a real three cross three matrix, and the sum of the eigenvalues cannot be. Uh, wait. I mean the. Yes, the sum cannot be imaginary. This is leading to an imaginary i. This has two imaginary values, but no problem. They will get canceled when you add them. This has no imaginary values. And this is e to the power i theta plus e to the power minus i theta. This is nothing but cos theta, twice cos theta, right? So twice cos theta is real. So this is the answer. Okay. So uh, with this, I'd like to conclude today's class. Okay. So to all my students whom I